So, uh, good morning, Gary, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, if you will, and uh, maybe just give us a little bit of um, a little bit of background to you, your career, and where you are at this stage. Well, thank you very much, Eamon. I'm a clinical sports psychotherapist. I think I'm the only one um, with that title working in first team football in the UK. Um, I work with Oxford United from the first team to academy, uh, first team staff, coaching staff, um, everybody at the club. Uh, and I'm kind of working more, I suppose the word would be holistically, uh, looking after players' well being, because my strap line, I suppose, is that happier players are better players. This is a way that uh, sports psychology has been going over the past year to five years. Um, and we feel this is the right direction to go in, but nobody's ever given it the, the title sports psychotherapy. Uh, my background is broadcast journalism. Um, I've been a commentator for many years, and then I retrained about 10 years ago to be a clinical psychotherapist. I work in London and I work in Oxford. Uh, and because of my background, my work has inevitably graduated, um, or gravitated rather towards, towards working with sports people, not just footballers, rugby players, cricketers, snooker players, all sorts of players who are finding it difficult sometimes to be in the public limelight and with all the pressure that brings, brings a different set of um, psychological pressures. Right, and so uh, with that background, how does that translate into your day-to-day -day role at the football club, for example? Well, I'm part-time at the football club and I go in two to three times a week. <coughs> Excuse me, I would normally... Uh, meet up with first team players, management, staff, and just very, very gently check in, check in with them and make sure they're okay. And everybody, you, me, footballers, coaches, staff, academy staff, youngsters, will have personal problems at, at some level. Um, and my job is to help them realize those, get over those. Psychotherapy is about change. And if we are prepared to change our lives and prepare, prepared to change the way we look at our lives, very often quite extraordinary things can happen, especially for sports people. Yeah. And I believe Oxford United are having a good season at the moment. Is, can you take any credit for that, Gary? None whatsoever. <laughs> when, I, when I joined, we were in the relegation zone. Um, so <clears throat> look, this isn't just about me, it's about the first team management and, and board of directors and everybody yeah. at the club who bought into a way of thinking about player care. And yeah. we like to think we might be in League One, or maybe for the time being we're in League One, maybe in the Championship next year. But we're Premier League when it comes to player care and looking after our staff at the football club because we think that's more important than anything. Yeah. And just a timely question, really, given the environment that we all find ourselves in and clubs have locked, locked down technically and have you found have you found that you've been in more demand or have you found a niche way of kind of uh, addressing this this issue uh, and the concerns that the players have and how how psychologically this might affect them i think you ask a really interesting question Eamon. um You'd think that would be the case. And actually, for most of my clients who are non-sports clients, I've seen a big upturn in the number of referrals I've had. People are very concerned about how they self-isolate, how they look after loved ones. Are their mums and dads going to be okay? Are their grandparents going to be okay? But you know, psychologically, the reverse is true of sport. Because research has shown that when things get tough for sports people, the first thing they do is go into their shells. Mm. And this is where football clubs, I think, have a huge responsibility now to reach out to their players who are self-isolating, who are at home, mm. and saying to them, look, we are here for you. And it's not just good enough to say, here's my number, give me a call if it's all right. Because, you know, we know as sort of men uh, and women as well, you know, one of the hardest things you can ever, ever say in the world is help. Yeah. And when we say help, extraordinary things happen. Footballers, rugby players, cricketers... Uh, all sports people are not great at saying help. It normally has to go to a really, really difficult area before somebody will mention that four-letter word. Yeah. And I'm urging all football clubs to psychologically reach out to their players. And I would say it's not good enough just to send them a telephone number. And if you're feeling a bit low, give us a call. Yeah, it's kind of proactive uh, care, isn't it, really? Engaging with them, not giving them the choice, perhaps, and uh, just, just taking the decision and, and contacting directly. 
Um, just aside from that, I was interested to hear that you're actually undertaking some study at the moment, uh, some research with, with regards to sleep. Okay, what, uh, tell us a little about that, if you will. Well, it's again sort of very much the theme of being proactive rather than reactive. But we, uh, we've started a sleep um, uh, experiment at Oxford United where first team players uh, have wearables in the form of a ring. And the ring mon monitors the quality of your sleep. There's two basic areas of sleep. One is REM, a rapid eye movement sleep, which is a dreaming sleep. And then there's non-REM sleep. And unless you get enough of each, your body's not recovering well enough. I can't go into details because it's confidential, who's wearing the rings and yeah. the research. But the big, the interesting breakthrough that I will share with you and share with people listening to this podcast is you would think that after the adrenaline rush of playing in a football match, say in a midweek game, the players would find it very difficult to get to sleep. You'd think that, wouldn't you? That would make mm. sense. They're mm. upped up with caffeine and adrenaline and excitement. And, and even as a fan, I find it sometimes hard to get to sleep after I've watched a big game. Mm. But actually, the biggest problem is rest days when players are not at the training facility and they're at home having a recovery day. The quality of their sleep that night is worse than normal. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, fascinating. Well, I hope to uh, hear a little bit more about that at some point. Uh, and uh, perhaps we could uh, be privy to some of the results and some of the, uh, some of the outcomes from that study. Uh, so on that, on that note, then, do you, um, do you have any kind of tips or, or guidance for the medical team at other clubs that, that are interested in, in these sleep patterns and the benefit of it? Do you have any tips and guidance on that side of it? Well, I would certainly say I would recommend them thinking about doing a sleep uh, audit of their players because mm. the only way that players really get to recover after a game, the only effective way is rest and, and sleep. Mm. And if one of your players is unable to sleep or has sleep issues, or there are sociological reasons why players having sleep issues, for example, there's a new baby, there's a, a new pet or their partner's disturbing them, that's going to impact on their game. And my understanding is, and what we're trying to do, is we think we can predict um, possible future injuries or breakdown of muscle groups because of lack of rest and recovery. That's the idea of the sleep project. But at what stage are your players going to hit a, uh, an optimum beyond which they would break down and they would have what you might use you loosely describe the typical uh, quad, hamstring, knees, all those sort of things that's going on. So I, th I think with proper rest and recovery, I think it makes those type of injuries a lot less likely. Mm. The theme of our conference, which we were going to hold this year, was about the multidisciplinary team. And, and I, I guess you feel quite a, a, a significant part of that at Oxford. Uh, how, how does that work? How do all the staff integrating the liaise with you and do you feel that you are now a part of the fabric of that team? Well I'd hate to say that because maybe my P45 will arrive on Monday with the <laughs> coronavirus uh, um, uh, outbreak. Um, it's taken a while, it's taken a long time to get buy-in from certain players who mm. are you know sometimes resistant to psychological intervention. I think that's that's the nature of the beast. Football is I think miles behind cricket and rugby in this, in how we look at psychological intervention, what it's there for, how we best use it. There's a lot of suspicion going on. Um, I've, I'm allowed to access all areas at Oxford United in a way that I don't think any other psychologist or psychotherapist is allowed to do inside their football club. So it's yes, I am part of a multidisciplinary team, but I've had to maybe educate myself and educate the club of how best to use me. Mm -hmm. And that is an ongoing process. <clears throat> and a process that is only, you know, in the current crisis is, is being redefined almost on a daily basis. I've got telephone calls planned mm -hmm. later today with key members of the football club. We have to keep reinventing ourselves. We have to keep thinking of new ways of looking after player. It's about player care. And I think football is v at the very, very start of its journey of how we truly look after our players psychologically. Right. Well, great to catch up with you, Gary. Listen, um, it'd be good when you complete the study, uh, get some more information from that, that that might be useful to the rest of the multidisciplinary team. So perhaps we can get back in touch with you in, in a short while and uh, 
not for part two. How does that sound? That sounds great. I'm always, I'm really, really keen to support your work, the your organisation's work. It's a vital. What I really like about your organisation is is multidisciplinary, and yeah. all the individuals and different professions can pull together and share our knowledge bases, and ultimately serve the football industry as best we can. Yeah, that's great. Brilliant. Thanks, Gary. We'll be in touch.